Hello friend, happy Thursday. Last time we were together, it was Tuesday and I started some kombucha, but I never got to bottling it or finishing it until yesterday. Yesterday was Wednesday, it was a computer day for me. All I did was computer stuff, but I also got that kombucha into a second ferment and I wanted to show you how absolutely beautiful this second ferment is going. So I flavored this with mango nectar that I got at Costco and just a couple strawberries from the homestead that I freeze dried. I haven't mixed it together. I just poured the mango juice in and I topped it with some berries. And I wanted to show you how beautiful. It almost looks like a sunset because the mango is heavier, I guess, than the strawberries. And so it just looks really beautiful. So I will mix that up before we drink it so that you know the flavor is nice and mixed. But I thought I would just show you how pretty that is. And then I wanna show you down here. I did go ahead and I split my scobies into two. So what that did, that allowed me to now have two gallons of kombucha brewing. So to split your kombucha and double the amount of kombucha you're making, it's really easy. All of these scobies were in one jar and when I made my tea, I doubled it. So I put 20 tea bags in water, I let that steep, and then I added two cups of sugar because I wanted to make two gallons. I took half the scobies and I put half of them in this jar. And then I kept back two cups of starter culture and I put one cup of starter culture in here, one cup in here, and then I put half the tea in each one of these. I filled it up with water, I covered it, and now I have two gallons of kombucha brewing at one time. And that is a good amount for Josh and I when we're drinking it with dinner. So I'm gonna go ahead and just close this back up. We're gonna let this ferment for two weeks and then we will bottle it in the second ferment, flavor it, and then we will be able to pop it in the fridge. So these bottles have been sitting on the counter since yesterday. I also wanted to show you that you can reuse kombucha bottles. These work really well to do second ferment in them as well. You don't have to go buy anything special if you've already been consuming kombucha from the store. Save your bottles and you can do a second ferment on those. So I like to have these sit for two to three days on the counter. So once they have done that, I will pop them in the fridge and we'll be able to enjoy some cold kombucha. But now we're gonna head out into the grow room. Last time we were out here together, we started a bunch of winter squash and summer squash and cucumbers. And I only got a few of them planted up. Well, I came back later that night and I got the rest of them planted. And then I picked out a few more. So these are ones that I have not shown you yet. <laughs> I got these in the mail and I thought that I would give them a try because I think this pumpkin is absolutely stunning. So we're gonna try to grow this fairy tale pumpkin. It's an heirloom variety. And then I did go ahead and I planted up a few more of these mini white pumpkins to decorate in the fall. These are baby boo. And then I realized I had forgot to start melons as well. So I started two different varieties, these Kajar Kajari melons and these little cantaloupe variety. These are an heirloom variety as well, both of these are. And we're gonna give these melons a try. Last year was the first year I attempted to grow melons and I direct sowed them into the ground and I did not get one to germinate. So this year is why I've decided to go ahead and try to start them as seed inside so that hopefully I can keep a closer eye on them. I can make sure that they stay moist the entire time until they germinate and we can try to get some success growing melons this year. So we still need to build the, the melon trellises, but we at least have started the first step of getting them started. But before we head out into the garden, I am going to water these. That's one reason I wanted to start these indoors so I could keep a really close eye on them. And I am watering them every morning and afternoon because pumpkin seeds have a really thick hole around them and I wanna make sure that the pumpkin seed stays nice and moist so that it can kind of break through the plant, can break through that hole. It'll keep the seed nice and soft and we can hopefully get some really good germination rate this way. So I don't know, this is my first time doing it this way. I've got my Vermont compost in here, which I'm so happy about and we're just getting everything watered in real well so what we're doing today since i have a minute to talk with you my dad is on his way over here and we are going to do a project on the raised beds i want to seal them to protect them so that hopefully they can last a long time so that's what my dad and i are going to be doing today 
is starting that project. That's going to be a massive project. I don't know if we're going to get it done today, but he was available to help me today. So we're going to get as far as we can today. I not only needed to make sure that my dad was available to help me, but we also needed a stretch of nice weather. And we've got a stretch of some beautiful weather out there. So that is what we are going to be doing today. Even though what I would rather be doing, let me show you. I don't know if rather would be doing is the correct term, but something that really, really needs to be done is plant out these pepper plants and all of these plants out into the garden. But I am working with what I have. And right now I have my dad's help to help me seal beds. So these plants are just gonna have to wait. I also filled up these two green stalks with soil and made a mess on the patio. So I need to get this cleaned up as well, but I don't know if we're gonna get to that today. I did have to purchase a couple things for the project for today. So I got some sealing equipment. I got a little tray and then I got some rollers. So my dad's gonna bring his large roller and I bought a little roller so that we have both a large one and a small one, depending on if we're working on the small side of the raised bed or the large side of the raised bed. And then I also purchased some really <laughs> inexpensive brushes so that we could brush in the corners if we need to where the rollers aren't gonna get and then we can go ahead and toss these. I like that these are not the plastic foam ones, they are wood, but they were I think $2 each so we can use them and then if we can't wash out the varnish because I don't think we're going to be able to, we can just go ahead and toss them. And then I grabbed a couple extra rollers just in case we're going to need them because like I said this project is probably going to span some time. But I always feel like when we have higher numbers of people, whether it's just me or one other person, I can get exponentially more done in a day than just what I can do by myself. So I'm really grateful for my dad for coming over to help us with this project. This is the brand that I am going to seal my raised beds in. I did a lot of research to find a non-toxic sealer. And from my research, this is what I found. So I can link this down below. I got this on Amazon. I thought I ordered four gallons, but only two showed up. So maybe I only ordered two. So we're, we're just gonna go until this runs out. We're only gonna be sealing the outside of the raised beds, but even so, I wanted to try to find the most natural sealer possible because we're obviously gonna be growing food in those beds. And this has, it says, durable, creates a non-toxic waterproof barrier, protects wood from UV rays, mold, and mildew, and it dries in an hour. It's easy cleanup with soap and water. The reason I wanna do this is because my raised beds are made out of cedar, which is already a natural, wood that resists mold. Most raised beds are recommended to be built out of cedar, but they will turn gray over the years if I don't seal them. And because we have the stone around the raised beds, that's gray. I really wanna keep that beautiful contrast between the cedar and the wood, or the cedar and the stone. And this is gonna help not only keep them beautiful, but it's gonna help them last for a longer period of time. So I'm gonna go bring this outside. My dad is not here yet, but I think I'm just gonna to try to get this project started. Um, we do need to clean off some of the raised beds, so I think I should probably grab a broom. I need the wood to be dry before we paint on the sealer, so I don't wanna wash the beds with water, but I think the ones that are dusty, I can just use a broom and get them clean that way. And one thing I wanna say is that if you're not comfortable sealing your raised beds, then that is okay. <laughs> this is just something I want to do for my garden, and I think that it's gonna help them last a lot longer and it's gonna keep their beauty. So I just grabbed a little container thingy here so that I can pour our sealer into our little container over this so that I just have some protection and I'm not hopefully gonna spill it on my entire walkway out there. So let's see, let's see if I can carry all of this out there. Here we go, we are gonna get going on this massive project. So how I came about this product 
was I googled non-toxic sealers for gardens and I read a bunch of different lists and this product kept coming up as the number one product. So that's why I purchased it. So here's kind of an overview of the, the scale of the project that we need to get started on today. These are the raised beds. They are 16 feet by four feet and there are 20 of them. I'm waiting for my dad to get here, so I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. I'm going to read up on the product, and I'm gonna see exactly what this whole thing is going to entail. So the first thing I do is I kind of move some of these stones away from the raised beds. I go around the garden bed, and I take the broom, and I'm just trying to get the majority of the dust and debris off of the raised beds. This ends up being the hottest day of the year so far, and I do end up using some water to scrub any areas where there is like mud streaks on the raised beds because the heat of, and the sun dries it really quickly so that it dries in time that we can then go ahead and seal it. So I'm just taking the broom though first and I'm getting any dust that's not stuck on the bed that's just kind of sitting on there off. So I brush around the entire top of the bed and the sides of the bed. My goal is to try not to seal in any dust, debris, or anything like in the raised bed. On this raised bed here, you can see here are some peppers that I've started to bring down. I've been hardening off my peppers. I already planted all of my tomatoes at this point, and I do want to get to planting my peppers and all the other starts that I have started. But, you know, we can only tackle so many things and I, I'm always trying to figure out what is the next best thing to do. <laughs> and my dad was available on this day and it was supposed to be sunny for at least a week. So this was the next best thing that needed to be done. I really want to try to keep the color and integrity of the raised beds and I want to keep them as healthy and as sturdy for as long as possible. So that is why I decided ultimately to do this project. I did not seal my raised beds at my last house, and I don't even think I ever even considered it. But I was thinking that I really want to keep the color because I want to keep the contrast of the wood and the stone. And so, and then I want to keep them strong from weather. So that is kind of where I got this idea. So what I'm doing is I'm opening up this canister. I did read the directions on how to do this. And the directions actually say that you need to do two coats and you wanna make sure that the sealer is not completely dry before you do the second coat. So I didn't realize that until after I read the directions, obviously. I'm smelling it because the VOCs are rated very, very low and there's hardly any smell to it the directions also say before you get on to your project what you should do is try a sample board that's what i'm doing right here there were a bunch of different color options you could choose when picking this product in particular and i went with a clear so i didn't think that i would need to do a sample board because i was just going to do a clear coat which is going to bring out the natural color of the cedar but when i was reading the directions i thought you know what i better go ahead and do a sample just in case <laughs> before i put this product on an entire bed and i can already tell here i just put it on a little piece of cedar scrap and i'm really liking the way it looks so here we go i am getting the product on the first raised bed while i'm waiting for my dad i just went ahead and dove right into it now I want to go back to what I was talking about, the VOCs. So VOCs are when a product like paint or stain or something like that is rated for how smelly a product is. VOC stands for volatile organic compounds, and they are a large group of chemicals that are found in many products we use in building and maintaining our homes. Once these chemicals are in our homes, they release an off gas in the, and into the air, whether that's into our homes or, or into wherever it might be. So here, obviously, I'm outside, and so these VOCs are releasing into the air, but it also has to do with when you're working with a product, how much you're breathing in those off gases and those smells. 
and this was rated really, really low, and it barely had an odor at all, so it was not kind of noxious to work with. It was very, very pleasant. And like I said, I just randomly Googled a product that was supposed to be a healthier option than one that I would just get at a big box store. I tried to find this at my local box store because I wanted to get it quicker than what I could get online and I couldn't find it. So I went ahead and I did order this off Amazon. And you can see how it's starting to change the color a little bit. It's just brightening up the cedar that's naturally there. This product has very, very low viscosity and so it drips. So you can see how it's dripping down a little bit. I found after doing quite a few of these boxes, it definitely is best if you start from the top and work your way down. It seems obvious, but it did take a little bit to realize that. And you can see this bed has got one coat on it, except for the very last little bit. I need to take a brush to the very, very base around the wood or not the road, around the stone. My dad showed up and he gets going on working on some of the beds as well. He ends up using a larger roller and is working on the taller side. And I end up going around the top with a brush and doing the top and doing the shorter side. Now, I am working very hard on not getting any of this product into the raised bed at all. And after I, on this day, I was doing even more research on this and I found out that you can actually seal your raised beds using beeswax. And that obviously would be the best and most natural form of sealer to seal on a raised bed for veggies. After we did this project, I came across another way to seal your raised beds that is an, an even more natural way to do it than the way that I did it here is to seal it with beeswax and walnut oil. So you can take beeswax and walnut oil and melt that together in a double boiler, and then you can apply that to your raised beds. Maybe that's something I will do in the future, but that just wasn't something that I was gonna be able to do realistically this year on all of these raised beds. So I opted for this option. And I so far have been really happy with it. Time will tell how it lasts. My dad, you can see here, he's got the large roller and he is rolling it on the tall side of the raised beds. This garden is at, a, is at about a 10% grade and that is why the raised beds are not the same height on each side. One side is a lot taller and one side is a lot shorter and that way we could build these raised beds so that they could be level on the top and then they can be taller on one side and shorter on the other side to kind of take up where that slope is. I don't know if that makes sense, but, but that's why they're taller on one side and shorter on the other side. And it's been super nice so far. I wasn't sure how well this was gonna work, having different heights on the raised beds, but I can definitely tell you so far, the little bit I've been out here gardening in it, I've been really, really enjoying it. You can see on the back side of these raised beds, I have some trellises. Those are tomatoes that are trellised along there. The tall side of the raised bed faces south. And so on the short side of these raised beds, the sun rises over where my dad is. It comes up over the garden and sets on the other side of where I am. And what that does is it makes it so that I want my really tall veggies on the back side of these raised beds so that the shadow is casted on the walkway where I'm standing and it's not going to be, my tomatoes aren't going to be shading out other veggies. So on the top five raised beds, I planted tomatoes because they're going to get really tall and I didn't want to put them in the middle of the raised bed or in the front of the raised bed on the down hillside because then anything I plant in the rest of the raised bed is going to be shaded out. So you can see that there are holes in front of the tomatoes and trellises. I went ahead and I burned holes in the landscape fabric. That was another project my dad and I did. We put landscape fabric on the majority of these raised beds that I've been planting in them and I'm absolutely loving it. 
At first, after I put the landscape fabric down, I was not sure if I had made a huge mistake, but I was committed to it. One of the main reasons why I thought I would made a mistake is because you have to burn holes in the landscape fabric. We have that first bed is officially done, and now we're gonna start the second coat on this bed. But the reason you need to burn holes in the landscape fabric is because it's a woven fabric and the, the wovenness is great because you want that so that water can penetrate it. But if you cut a hole in it and you don't burn it, then it will un, it will just fray everywhere and it won't last. I want this landscape fabric to last me a few years. And so you need to burn a hole so that it seals those edges. And I couldn't figure out how to use my blowtorch and it was super tedious and annoying. Every time I needed to burn a hole, I had to relight my blowtorch and I just was not enjoying it. And then Josh showed me how to use the blowtorch and it's so easy and I'm loving it. And what I'm really hoping, I'm really hoping that this landscape fabric is something that I will be able to use a couple years. And so next year I won't even have to burn the holes in the landscape fabric. I will mark each one and know which one it, you know, what the spacing is in each one. I don't want to plant the same thing in the same bed next year because I want to rotate my crops. So I am going to pull all this landscape fabric up at the end of the growing season, but I will mark what I had planted in it. And so that then I can just put that on another bed and then next year, hopefully, I can reuse the landscape fabric and I don't even have to burn the holes. So here I'm showing you the difference between two coats. These two beds right here have two coats on them. And then right here, this area just has one coat on it. And then this area is still raw wood. So that's kind of the difference in the color. It brightens it up a little bit. What my dad and I were doing is I would go do a coat and then I would move on to the next bed and then he would come behind me and do the second coat because it was about 75 degrees at the hottest part of this day. The product was drying relatively quickly and so you didn't want it to be completely dry before you put the second coat on. So we were kind of working together in getting this project done. So I would do one coat and then he would come behind me and do another coat or vice versa. We kind of took turns depending on what we were doing. We, we just worked together in getting this project done. So we both enjoyed using the brush and the roller, just depended on what we were doing. If we were doing the second coat or the first coat, I enjoyed using the brush on the top and then the rollers on the side. My dad right here, he is doing the second coat on this bed and he wanted to apply it very, very liberally. So he was enjoying using the brush. One thing that I was a little bit worried about when we first started this project was if this sealer was going to stain the stone walkway at all and it doesn't stain the stone walkway at all. So that was something that I was happy that we didn't have to worry about putting a drop cloth down or anything like that. So if we had used one of, it, they have the same product in a multiple, to, multiple different colors where you could actually add a stain to your wood if you wanted to, then you probably would have to use a drop cloth or something in order to prevent staining on areas you don't want staining. But with this seal clear one, you didn't have to worry about that. And so that was a huge relief that we, we could work a little bit quicker because we didn't have to worry about if we dripped a little bit because it was so liquidy. It definitely, you know, did drip quite a bit. And so here it is just going on. And I'm really, really happy with the way that this is turning out. And it went a lot farther than I was expecting. This stuff goes really far we're, and we're not being stingy with it. We're going liberal because we figured if we're putting it on, we might as well put it on well. So we thought we were only gonna get uh, seven beds done, but we have more and we're just gonna go until it's all gone. So I, my dad's just finishing up the second coat on the sixth bed. So I just 
started cleaning this bed. I need to finish cleaning this side here. And then I'll put one more coat on this bed, or I will put a coat on this bed. And hopefully we'll be able to get two. It's very hot, so I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking. It's not even that hot, but we're just not used to it. I think the high is supposed to be, what, 67 today? I don't know. Oh, I could look on my phone. Um, anything above 55 feels very warm to us. Let's see. And I'm so glad I have Josh's hat to wear because I would not be able to be out here this long if I didn't have a hat on. Let's see. Weather. Oh, it's 70. It's already 70 degrees out here. No wonder it's so hot. Okay, so let me finish cleaning this one side and we'll see how far we get. Well, we got eight. We think we're going to get eight beds done with two gallons. We have 20 beds, so we need another uh, two gallons to go to 16, and then we'll have four more, so we'll probably need about another two gallons. So, so get four more? Yeah, so get okay. four more gallons, and that should cover it with some extra. Perfect. Okay. I'll do that. My mom was a little bit disappointed. She wasn't able to come out and help on this day. <laughs> and my dad and I reassured her, no worries. We only got eight beds done, so there will be more where this came from. So she'll probably come out in the next couple weeks and we will work on sealing the rest of the beds. But you can just see here how it kind of just written, richens up the color of the wood. All right, with two gallons, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beds completely done. And the eighth bed has one coat on it. And I can show you how much is left in the container. There's just a little bit at the bottom. And so my dad's gonna go around and he's just gonna put maybe one more coat on until it's all gone on the cut ends because that soaks it up a ton because it's not enough to really save, but we also don't want to waste it. So he's just going to keep putting it on those end caps until it's all gone. And then he's going to start picking up a couple things that we use today. And while he's doing that, like the, the rollers and we'll take, we will go ahead and toss. I, I bought three of these roller pads. We'll just toss this one because it's filled with dirt and debris. So he's going to do that for me, which is a great blessing so that I can run inside and make the us, my dad and I, and the landscapers some strawberry lemonade. It's two o'clock. My dad got here at 1030 and that's how long it took us to get that many beds done. So great progress. We made this together. Well, we made it from strawberries that grew on this homestead, but I had the strawberries in the, in the freezer and we probably made this. I didn't put what month, but not that long ago. And all it is is strawberries, lemon juice, and sugar. And it's great because I can whip up a wonderful drink in just a minute here that's homemade, homegrown. I can link this recipe down below if you wanna make your own concentrate. You can use any fruit. You could use peaches. One of you all wrote me and said you made this with peaches and I thought that sounded fantastic. I might steal that idea this year. You can make it as sweet or as diluted as you wanted to, or concentrated as you want. The recipe is a one-to-one, -one, one part sugar or concentrate to one part water, but I find that to be a little bit too sweet for me. So I do a half gallon per pint, and that seems to be really yummy. And I'm gonna give this a taste test to make sure it tastes good before I serve it to them. I did wash my hands really well before I made this, just so you know, because I do need to take a shower after all that out there. Oh, that's perfect. You know what would be really good that I've never done with this before? Would be to add some fresh basil and have basil strawberry lemonade, um, basil strawberry lemonade, or to make black tea or even green tea and make kind of like an Arnold Palmer with this concentrate. This is so good. My dad, I can see, is just finishing up. I'm gonna take him to lunch. The baby, him and I are gonna go to lunch. And I just really appreciate his help. I hope that one day I can be a blessing 
to my son, just as much as my dad and my mom are a blessing to me, willing to come help on the homestead. And I just, they're a great example. So I'm really, I love them. And I, I'm just grateful that he took time out of his day to help me on my homestead. And I just wanna be able to bless him by taking him out to lunch today. And I don't have any, I, mean, I have leftovers when we were together working. What, I don't even know, I'm tired, I'm hot, I can't even think. But last time we were together, I had pulled out a freezer meal of stroganoff and my we went and helped my mother-in-law in her garden she ended up feeding us dinner so I threw that freezer meal in the refrigerator and last night after my computer work day I went ahead and I made that up for us so I that's the only food that I have prepared <laughs> and Josh and I will probably will eat that for dinner tonight again but I don't want to serve that to my dad <laughs> so I'm going to take him to lunch and I hope he enjoys that I just want to say a huge thank you for taking time out of your day to spend time with me as we got a huge chunk of this project done this project <laughs> is a bigger project than i anticipated but we got a lot more done than i thought that this product this is just one i googled i don't know if it's going to last the test of time but it had really good reviews and it seemed to be the most non-toxic out of all the sealers i'm really happy with the color and the look so it's going to be another big push to finish but i'm just really grateful what we got done today so thank you for being here thank you for being you and i can't wait to see you next time Bye, friend.